Okay, and we are going. Uh, well, not quite going because I got to get the get the slideshow going. God damn it! <laughs> Wait, that's not what I wanted to do. Crap! How do block. I? How do I? Hi, we're idiots, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not that stupid. It's just a complicated, you know, series of pre-flight checks we have to do in order to get this plane flying. Pre-flight <laughs> checks. DCS world ass. Yes, exactly. Um, that's going. That's going. Zencaster's going. We're going. Oh my god! All right. Um, Welcome to Tuesday Night Action. No way, yeah, wrong um, podcast. So if if you just if you just cut in here, um, Reinhold Messner is Italian. Reinhold. So Messner we. So I've learned from Italian. the comments. Reinhold Good Messner Lord. is Italian. I stop telling me that Reinhold Messner is Italian. I swear to God, I put in two whole slides about how I don't respect you people when you correct me on the facts, and what do you yeah. do but correct me on the facts again? I'm gonna it. get more stuff wrong on purpose. Reinhold Messner yeah. is Swiss now. Eat yeah. shit. No, he's Swedish. We're gonna keep moving him around. <laughs> yeah, the sort of like, the thing at the start of the show is we announce what nationality Reinhold Messner is this, this Fortnight. Reinhold like Messner the, uh, is from Swaziland. The joke uh, that they wanted to do with Daniel Craig in the uh, uh, Knives Out series. Oh, Just giving him a different accent every time. Yeah, inexplicably. Yeah. Oh, that'd be funny. <laughs> that, that I think would have would have made the second one a better film. Well, Knives Out too, but he's talking like the the South African Sams from Auntie Donna. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I'm I'm very very on board with this. Very into it. Yeah. Um. Welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. I'm Justin Rosnack. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. Okay, go. I'm Alice Caldwell Kelly. I'm the person who's talking now. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a very sleepy girl because it's uh, 11 p.m. where I am. So we'll see if I make it through this. Yeah, Liam. Yeah, Liam. Sorry, I had a mouthful of C4 uh, flavors. Plastic this? explosive. Yes. Frozen yes. bombsicle, of course. Mm, delicious, uh, my delicious pronouns plastic. Are he, him. I know it's Easy. safe to burn, but I don't think it's safe to eat. No, I think. Wait, hey, I, why don't you mind your goddamn business, Nanny State? <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'm so full of delicious C4 plastic explosive. I sure am. Someone get me the nutrient facts sheet on that, you know? Bad. Mm. It just says bad. <laughs> hey, where'd all the C4 plastic explosive go? Liam's like sitting there, so like chomping away. Like, yeah. I don't know. Find what is it? Munching block of Kerrygold butter. Yeah. <laughs> oh damn, we do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you see on the screen in front of you is a big boat running into a small boat. Yeah, beautiful, right? beautiful illustration, beautiful yeah, like, like uh, nineteenth-century illustration of of peril. You know, you yes. seldom sort of like see an illustrated peril anymore. You don't, but... you don't see peril anymore in this way. No, no, you just see nine um, eleven. You, you, there's yeah, there's more peril in the world, but there's less illustrations of it. Yeah, because yeah. the thing is, the, the the illustration of peril captures the like fateful moment in a very dramatic way. Whereas now, you're as you're, you're like as not to see like some cell phone footage that ends with someone like lying dead on the ground or like scattered across like uh, you know square or something, uh, and yeah. the moment of peril passes by very quickly. Whereas here, you have like frozen and immortalized it to tell us a story of morality. Tale. Immortalized peril as opposed to the modern peril where you get hit by a missile that turns you into mortadella or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like being turned into cold cuts, I can tell you that right now. Reinhold Messner's presumably favorite cold cut on account of the fact that he is Italian. Of course yes. he is in fact Italian, as we know. Um, so... Fuck you! Uh, <laughs> today, we're going to talk about um, a weird disaster, a surprisingly deadly disaster, and also a, a disgusting disaster, yeah, does it involve poop? Yes, it does. Yeah! <laughs> we are going to talk about the sinking of the SS Princess Alice. Oh no, that's us! That, yeah, that's right. The, the Princess yeah. Alice disaster, or as I was known for the first year after I came out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited yeah. to talk about this one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is. Uh, I didn't realize how bad this one was until I started looking into it. Worst inland maritime it is, disaster in British history. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, and for a seafaring nation, you know, we've killed a lot of people in our inland waterways. Uh, well, but it. Not, not as many as here. Exactly. Inland waterway isn't the sea. Once you get in a river, they fucking suck. <laughs> yeah. Well, as soon as someone decides it's navigable, you got to try and actually navigate it, and then, then you're fucked. Then you're up shit creek. Yeah. Yeah. 250 dead on canal boat. Oh. <laughs> After it becomes mildly waterlogged. <laughs> It's a boat. It's supposed to be water. Well, not waterlogged, I suppose. Yeah. You, you, if anything, yeah. a boat is supposed not to be waterlogged. The log, the loggedness is, you know, not where yes. you keep the water. So before we talk about the peril, we have to talk about the peril. It's time to do the goddamn news. I have a free hand. No. Yeah. Not a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Just open with the the beloved Kill James Bond news theme there. Yes, the uh, the ongoing peril uh, in Palestine continues. Mm -hmm. They they are hoping now. Biden says, if you believe his senile ass, that uh, they are very close to a deal uh, which will involve some kind of a prisoner swap, uh, where Hamas is going to release the women and children. It has in exchange for Israel releasing some of its also. Pretty like arbitrarily detained women and children uh, in its prisons, and it's now the question is: Is this a deal that, for the nth time in his career, Benny from Cheltenham, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, can sabotage at the eleventh hour to try and retain his hold on power? Um, I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see. I guess. Um, though I, I, there was this kind of sea change where he actually was forced finally to meet with some of the <laughs> families of the hostages. Oh um, boy. After oh. like weeks of ducking their calls. And he still right. did the like dictator thing of having a guy with no connection to, to the hostages just show up and tell him how great a job he was doing. Oh my um, god. You always gotta have a hype man, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is this is perhaps the, the most the hyped hype. man in Israel. Um and yeah, it's we at time of recording, I presume we'll have the big. This episode was recorded on the twenty first of November. Thing up on Thanks, screen. Devin. <laughs> at at time of recording, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, possibly there's going to be like a, a, a you know five day ceasefire in exchange for this uh, exchange of some some prisoners. But yeah. Meanwhile, of course, uh, the IDF are doing everything they can to sort of like get more of Gaza destroyed and occupied before the kind of clock runs down on that, which is also sort of standard. Uh, oh yeah, they've been, going, before. they've been going real hard in on uh, North, uh, on Gaza City itself, you know, it seems mm. like there's not, they're running out of things to blow up. Um, you know, I guess maybe this is why they're going after the hospitals, is they can't figure out what else to blow up anymore. Or they just like going after hospitals, which I think is the other thing. Yeah, um, I love doing it. The, the new thing it. now is um, uh, now having run out of stuff to bomb in the north, uh, looking at all the people who they made flee to the south and going, hey, there's a bunch of people in the south, and probably yeah, Hamas, is, get here? Hamas is like a conference room that we failed to find under the three sequential con uh, hospitals uh, at time of recording. Maybe that was in, in, in Khan Yunus, after all. Maybe it was in, in the south of Gaza, so we got to go in and we got to bomb that too. Uh, Maybe weird the secret hospital conference room was the friends we made along the way. Yeah, they actually, right. they actually move the hole. They move the hole somewhere else. That's real easy. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm interested. You know that the thing is, I, I guess what they've been doing today is, I think they hit the Indonesian hospital pretty hard. That's one of the big ones. But the Indonesian Navy is now sending a hospital ship over there, which I assume is still en route. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if they're going to have to say, well, there was a Hamas submarine underneath that we had to blow <laughs> oh, it know, up. They will. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is th th this is kind of like an easy win for for Muslim countries. Like the Jordanians have been, you know, building their field hospital on the border uh, on the Egyptian side. Um, so uh, you know, it's it helpful, I suppose. But uh, again, very. I don't limited. know if it's an easy win if you lose a hospital ship. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, Those things are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't know. I, uh, everything about this has been continuing to make me feel absolutely insane. Insane. 
Um, That's what it's supposed to do. Y yes, the yeah, and it's working very, very effectively. Um, I, I, you know, I said this on on Trash Future as well, but the thing is that, like, I think it's very easy to, you know, as a, as a, as a podcaster or whatever. To say, okay, well, what new can I say about this other than it feels like know, there's nothing other than yeah, just a yeah. but, feeling you know, of I, hopelessness. I, I have a fucking microphone in front of me, so I, literally, I, I I should be doing this. It should like have some measure of urgency to it. Um, and you know, now and previously and forever, it is free Palestine, right? Like, yeah, there is no possible end to this other than an end of occupation uh, and some semblance of a peace process. Um, but one yeah. country called country and one language called language. That's and, right. And I would like it. Helvetica. Uh, yeah, yeah. No so, longer are the French doing it. It's Liam, baby. Yeah. I mean, the, the there was one thing. Life. There was one thing I wanted to get your opinion on, Justin, which is there was uh, an op-ed in the Israeli press that's like, um, even if the war ends, Gaza could not be rebuilt because of the network of Hamas conference rooms, because that. of the tunnels. If they tried to rebuild it, it would just perfectly fall into the tunnels because it's Saw been that. like undermined. Um, that doesn't sound right to me. That's uh, kind of what I was asking. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. I mean, if the city of Reading, Pennsylvania, can exist, if the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania, can exist, yeah, those most have of which are on so top many of, Hamas tunnels under yeah, them. Yep, yeah, yeah, most of which have collapsed. Uh, <laughs> most of which is during uh, Hamas's uh, anthracite coal mining Hamas. phase. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's how you say it in um, coal region dialect. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> I'm the idiot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say other than continue to protest, uh, continue to to do things. There was there was a fascinating thing where some some activists um, uh, like protested outside and shut down the gate of um, this arms manufacturer, Elbert, um, in in the US, and uh, a bunch of them got extremely arrested, um, vastly disproportionately, you know, on, you know, the usual sort of charges of, of riot and so on. Um, but, you know, it's, it, whether that's, you know, something that you yourself should be doing, I can't answer, but that's, you know, it, it seems to me like good trouble, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hamas is actually Hazelton Anthracite Materials and Services. Oh my god. Um, oh, it's like I a sort of you. like red and blue thing, you know, like yeah. a you know, Builders League United. Um, yes, exactly. Do you do you want to hit me with what an IDF is, you know? Um I need to bring up Google Maps to find out a coal region town for this. Uh give me a second. It's gotta be <laughs> a coal region town still with an I. Uh, and just put the what Jeopardy. Is, don't put the it? Jeopardy music over. Don't, We're gonna don't do it. Yeah, we'll get copyright strike. Yeah. Just imagine, hum the Jeopardy music do, in your do, head. Do, do, no, do, do, no, no, that's too close. Too close. Too good. I got nothing. I don't think there is one. Oh god, damn it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, yeah, I, it's I, I, difficult to do comedy bits about the ongoing genocide. The fucking yeah, sucks. Auschwitz. Memorial, which that was has the been fuck. ruthlessly bad. politicized by uh, PIS, by the Law and Justice Party, the the right wingers mm -hmm. in Poland, um, and is now sort of like an ideological, uh, like right wing project in a lot of ways. Um, they they did their official statement on it, um, and their official statement is uh, sometimes sometimes you got to bomb a hospital, I guess. Um, it's it was just it was really really infuriating and insane. Um, there was a there there was a comedy bit y'all did on um, Trash Future, which I was uh, I enjoyed, but was confused by. Which was uh, mm. why does um, uh, what's the what's the horrible violent football club? Uh, Millwall. Millwall. Why are they Why are they uh, pro Israel? Because because West Ham stands for West Hamas, and you said that, Alice, <laughs> on the show, and I had to go back three times before I realized uh -huh. you weren't saying Worcester Mass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, these are identical phrases, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cross-cultural exchange, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a hell of a thing. So I just want to, okay, there is humor to be found here, but 
Also, people are getting killed a lot for no reason. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. It's, 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 to really say, it's, it's right? not the kind it's of thing like... where you'd like, oh, this is a thing that you can donate to. You know, it's yeah, you, right. you, you can't can, really do that. You can protest about it. You can uh, get yourself arrested on trumped up charges of like riot yeah. and vandalism. Uh, if you're up to that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, if you're up to it, you know, you can engage in direct action. We can't tell you how to do that. Uh, <laughs> no, we can we can only tell you that if you engage in the uh, extremely legal kinds of direct action, you might get arrested on suspicion of illegal ones anyway. Uh, yes, which you know, obviously we don't endorse. It's just uh, I don't. Know. You could get fired for your job for no reason. You could get so you could get absolutely one. fired from your job. Um, you could, you could get, uh, sort of blacklisted from getting, uh, like a job in future. You could get like filmed and identified and doxxed and threatened and all of this. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's still the right thing to do. So yeah. don't be, don't be too discouraged and do be encouraged by the fact that if you look at the polling, um, like support for Palestine in the U S even is higher than it's ever been um it's it's really just like a hardcore of zionists and the very old who are not repulsed by this and i think most normal people and especially young people uh are seeing what's happening and are like no this is insane why are we bankrolling this right yeah i mean unless you get all your news from cable news and like print newspapers like it's very hard to look away from this stuff mm. um yeah, you know, and 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 uh, you, you need a lot of like message discipline to spin this to the Israeli side, um, which exists in traditional media, but which does not exist elsewhere, and, and which has been fatally unbalanced, um, and is still in this kind of like strange spiral of accusing more and more things of being secretly Hamas, yes. um, the UN, the World Health Organization. Secretly Hamas, weren't you listening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this podcast, this this podcast has actually pod. we we have a, a Hamas agent that's infiltrated us in the form yeah. of the Activate Windows logo. Oh, yeah, no. actually, <laughs> and we we we've talked about digging tunnels before and how you do it. So you know, could be us. You don't <laughs> it's, know. It's true. Yeah, yeah. It could be milkshake. You know, it could, uh, could milkshake might be Hamas. That's true. Um, you have a basement, uh, like it's that. That's literally like. Don't worry uh, about that basement. Mm, I, okay. I don't. I don't like to go down there. No, it's on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, horror still ongoing in Palestine. What more can you say? From uh, the uh, river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I think. I don't let you. They don't let you say that anymore. That makes you Hamas. That's oh, awesome. Damn. Yeah. Oh, we've gone woke. We've done it. Yep. Yeah, I think yeah, I think. Can't wait the, for somebody the, in the comments to be like, "Why are they talking about?" It? Shut the fuck up! It, it it's make, more like it 150 makes episodes in. Shut the goddamn feel, hell up! Feel very unsafe, apparently. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't, don't, I don't care. like to make people feel unsafe. I don't do it gratuitously, but I, I, I simply think at this point you have to say, uh, it shouldn't. There's no reason for it to. Um, and maybe it's more important to talk about the people who are catastrophically unsafe. Yeah. Points at Albatross, Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you say Hamas, it makes me want to die a little bit. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In other news. All right. This is a jarring shift in tone. This is a fun jarring one. Jarring shift um, in tone. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so, so you know how we said that, um, and we didn't invent this, but we've copied it, that climate change is recording a like climate disaster watching a climate disaster on someone's phone uh, until you're the one recording it. Well, same here, but for specifically Taylor Swift concerts. Um, so Taylor Swift has gone to Brazil, um, and it's it's gone Concept poorly. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Brazil is currently in the grips of a massive catastrophic heat wave. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro right now, it feels like 50 degrees Celsius. Don't know what that is in Freedom Eagles. It's probably um, 100, 130 or so. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, before the uh, before the tour even started, one of the fans just died outright. 
Uh, actually, we don't know why yet, but it doesn't seem unreasonable to baselessly speculate that it's heat related. Um, and, and then, then she, she tweaked a lyric, and that was how she paid tribute to them. Yeah, it's like, sorry. And I love sorry, Taylor Swift, like, but get fucked. A 23 year old woman uh, like died, uh, another fan got stabbed. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then they got into the actual stadium, and she didn't perform uh, because of the high temperatures, but left everybody waiting in the stadium in those high temperatures, where in the stadium it was hitting like sixty degrees. European uh, like woke baguette units. Um, there's a quote from a fan in. Uh, it was reported by the AP, uh, where she says. Can you see how much I'm sweating? All the pores in my body are dilated from the sweat. I'm wearing a geriatric diaper. Come on stage, I want to see you. <laughs> 60 degrees else, Celsius though. is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's sauna temperatures right there. I, I assume since it's Brazil, it's a million percent humidity. Yeah, I, I do not understand putting yourself in that situation, in already in a heat wave, wearing a diaper to go and see- like, Taylor Swift, she's fine. The music is fine. You know, it's, it's a terrific yeah. performer. I will say sure, that. I've seen her I, live. I, but, uh, Not yeah, to defend T. Swizzle here, but- so, so, so I have also seen Taylor Swift live. How am I the only one out of us who hasn't seen Taylor Swift live? That's a well, I saw Taylor fact. Swift live accidentally. Ah, okay. he said, lying through his teeth. <laughs> Look, I, I, I only contributed minimally to the campaign where whoever sent in the most texts per high school would get a Taylor Swift concert at their high school. And in the end, it came down to a race between two high schools, which was Bishop Ireton High School and Thomas Jefferson High School in Northern Virginia. Those fucking dweebs. And, yeah, and somehow our tech spots won. Mm -hmm. Um. So you know the so you've seen um, Taylor Swift. Um, I have seen Taylor Swift. Yes. Unlike unlike a lot of Brazilians, uh, who oh. were like fainting, like a thousand people fainted in the audience at the first the first show. People were falling over and like burning themselves on metal surfaces. Oh. Um. And then there's there's a line in this AP story. Uh, uh, the postponement was followed by chaos outside the stadium. Under a light rain, a massive concert goes left the area, which is close to one of Rio's working class neighborhoods known as favelas. Videos shown on social media showed groups of pickpockets robbing fans of their belongings. Many took refuge inside a Burger King, ducking for cover under tables and behind the counter in the kitchen area, as heavily armed police raided the restaurant's basement, as loud sirens blared and those stuck outside the restaurant shouted. Some of those who were able to escape in taxis were overcharged by the drivers. It, it sounds hellish. Absolutely yeah. hellish. Um, sounds like, um... It sounds like trying to get out of a packed uh, game at the Meadowlands Stadium. Jesus Christ! Yeah, I, I mean, she, she, like, and then she finally performed, and she couldn't breathe on stage right. because it's like unbearably hot. Uh, at, at some point, I think you have to have some kind of safety mechanism to be able to say, "No, it is too hot for you to do this." Like this, this is not a safe place for you to like conduct any kind of activity, even like outdoors, right? Um, but we, you know, it, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, you see politicians routinely on on Twitter like posting Taylor Swift, please come to location because she right. brings in so much money, um, right. and people are like obsessed with her. Um, and yeah, the, it, you sort of like fatally compromise safety. And I worry that as the world gets hotter, this is only going to be more of a problem. You gotta gotta start considering moving Taylor Swift concerts to the opposite location. Taylor Swift, please come to Novosibirsk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Taylor Swift, please come to Climate Proof Duluth. Climate you know? Proof Duluth, uh, right. Murmansk, Greenland, Tro Tromso. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's 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 real sort of like um, this is something that makes me feel particularly bad. You know, now that we're you know, I, I read a thing on the Guardian front page a couple of days ago that said that we're just going to, like, as things are going, we're just going to blast straight through three degrees of, of warming, which is apocalyptic stuff. Um, oh, yeah, we just had, like, yeah. a real hot day yesterday, didn't we? We hit over 2C for the first time. 
Mm, and uh, yeah, so aside from that, uh, just sort of without anyone seeming to notice until it's on them, huge swaths of, of the world just become like almost uninhabitably hot, at least like un unlivably hot. Uh, for like you know weeks at a time, and that that happens so like every year now. Yeah, yeah, not good for you. Not good for you. Not good for you. Taylor Swift, come to a Munson Scott South Pole station. <laughs> <laughs> Why couldn't we get the cold apocalypse? I like too cold. I really, really don't like too hot. This is the I also worst. Do not like too hot temperature. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm a fat woman, right? I sweat a lot at the best of times. I don't want. Give me the cold one. Give me the one where I get to wear like fifty layers. You know. Yeah, yeah. Cold. The cold apocalypse looks better if you're a fat guy. You know, because mm, yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, like wear nicer clothes. You know, because fat guy in warm weather that doesn't work very well. It just you know you're never gonna look good. Um, mm, yeah. <laughs> unless you want to sweat your ass off. We're a very um, like pro layers podcast. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah, give me give me some layers. Hat. We're pros yeah. and like big coat. Um, yep. And yeah, if if you if you tried to do that get shit, some, get in... some extra hair for insulation, you know. Mm, yeah, uh, and if you try and do that shit in the Nilton Santos Stadium in Rio de Janeiro, you uh, sort of like broil yourself. Yeah, I would have been. I would have been literally sizzling. Yeah, you know, it'd be like have fat dripping off me. You could have oh. like. You God, cooked an egg in it, you know? <laughs> so the George Foreman for real. They've got like ducts coming out from under the big puffer Please make jacket. it stop. <laughs> Actually, come out the other side uh, healthier because I would have lost a lot of body fat. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's like you're like cussing weight like a boxer, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my god. Um, yeah, so it's it's a, a chilling portent of things to come. Um, I don't think it, I think it was a lot of things, but not chilling. A, a searing portrait. A searing, yeah. yeah, there we go. Searing, yes. A searing, at the very least, a saute. Yeah. Thank you, for, for Taylor Swift, I, I don't... She's really good. She's pretty good. I, I mean, I might... Like, I, I don't understand... I, it feels disproportionate to me. Like, the people who, like, drive themselves insane on the internet trying to convince her, themselves that she's a lesbian, secretly. Oh, oh yeah, that's a thing yeah, I, I just found out about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hashtag Gaylor. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I, I mean, I, you li you listen to uh, to Cruel Summer and tell me that's not about uh, Carly Kloss. No, not you two. Oh, oh, oh Christ, God, dude. <laughs> wow. wow. Before we, um, this is I, not a I am Taylor deep Swift into Swifty Twitter. Uh huh. <laughs> Well, the Swifties can like adopt you as one of their own, and I, I I'm gonna get pilloried in the comments again. Yeah. You know. Look, we can't. And you deserve it. We can't talk too much about Gaylor because that was already a subject two days ago on the QAnon Anonymous podcast, right? <laughs> we can't. I don't want to muscle in on anyone's turf. Mm. Anyway, that was the goddamn news. Ah, wait, yes. I recognize this city. Yeah. This city. This is uh, this is my favorite place in the world. Uh, it's my hometown. It's it's where I'm from. Uh, this is a, a little city called. London. Oh, I hate that yes. drop so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is London. Um, it's in Ontario. Uh, it's um, sure. <laughs> the University of like, Western Ontario. I what think, is, is it there? like? A, yeah, hundred miles. Hundred miles west of uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 yeah. But notably, London has the River Thames in it, right? It does. It's a bit yes. curvy bit. You can see it on the, the opening titles of EastEnders, if you want. Yes. There's a bunch of curvy bits, which we'll get to in they, a bit. In fact, uh, tried to get planning permission for a version of the sphere that they have in Las Vegas, the big like LEDs around the outside yeah. uh, thing that ruins your city. Uh, and uh, they were denied that planning permission. They're very saucy about it. That they're not able to like beam cryptocurrency ads into everyone's window in Stratford. Um, yeah, you know, as a, as a novelty, that thing works in Las Vegas, but I think in any other city, I wouldn't want to live within two miles of it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe if they put it where the dome is, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so London, it's a it's a beautiful city. It's where all the stuff is. I'm very very fond of it. When a man is tired of London, he's tired of life. It applies to all genders. Um, and uh, you know, is is great. Um, I think it fact. was 
I think it was one of the, I think it was when it was the biggest city in the world that was during the Victorian era, mm. um, you know, which is sort of the 1800s when Queen Victoria was Queen Victoria. Um, you know, seen here. The, yeah. Yeah. The once in future queen. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of shipping on the Thames because during when the British empire was, when the sun never set on the British empire, you were shipping a lot of stuff from a lot of places into London. Yeah. And why doesn't, you could, why it, doesn't the sun set on the British empire? Oh, cause it's in so many time zones. No, um, cause yeah. God doesn't trust an Englishman in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I should say part of the reason why London becomes as successful as it does is because it has a very wide, very navigable river that like, albeit curvy, Go straight up through the middle of it, and so you can bring all of your shit directly up to a wharf and unload it, uh, and you get all of this like riverboat traffic, which is ultimately killed off by containerization uh, and like increasing like draft of ships, which means that now the port of London is all at Tilbury and Essex, um, and they close down all of the like uh, the Docklands, which got sort of like uh, redeveloped into a kind of like yuppie hellscape. They got, they got, they got light railwayed. They did. I mean, the, yeah. I like the DLR, um, but it really, uh, being in Docklands, being in that whole area, is it, it's just sort of like it has the kind of. It's not quite the same thing as the city, but it has a kind of like ambient wealth and like sort of corporate nature to it that makes my teeth itch. I was like, I was like thirteen years old when I ran the uh, when I was on the Docklands Light Railway for the first and only time. Got to sit right at the front like I was driving the train. It was so mm -hmm. cool. Classic, yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things is when you have all this riverboat traffic on account of being the biggest city in the world, you got to somehow regulate it or people will bump into each other, right? Mm, yeah, which they um, did a lot. A like, lot, yeah. It's an absolutely routine occurrence, but you, you, you can't do that. It, it, it impedes the commerce, you know? So this is this this river's busy with barges. It's got large sailing ships. It's got small river boats. It's got rowboats. It's got ferries. It's got anything that floats. It's on a river. Mm -hmm. uh, dead bar dead bodies rolled up in carpet. You know. Uh, <laughs> well, before the Necropolis Railway, which I guess at yeah. some point we'll have to talk about, uh, where they just stuffed a train full of corpses. Um, yes. <laughs> so in the 1850s, it was decided. Uh, in much of the world, I don't know the exact source on that because the source I got was, uh, what is it, the Thames River Police site. Mm. They aren't clear on what their source for that is, though, or who exactly um, decided. But most river traffic in most of the world ran on the right-hand side. Uh, so, you know, as it would be, you know, right-hand driving like in America or in this case, you know, I... You, you, you're so you on drive on different sides of the road depending on whether or not you're a boat or a car. Yes. It's the same Very thing with the London Underground, too. Huh. Uh, so, you know, traffic on rivers should pass oncoming ships on their starboard hand. That is, you know, the, 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 the ship turns the starboard and they pass each other on their port sides. It's port to port, right? Hmm. Just keep right. Sure. Gotcha. But the Thames did not submit to these regulations. Ah. So the Thames is a tidal river, and as such, it was very beneficial economically to hew towards the center of the river when the movement of the tide was beneficial to you, and then when the tide was against you, you sort of take more of an F1-style racing line through the inner corners of the river to cut off some distance and also go through the slack water, which is where the movement of the river is the slowest at the inside of the turn. Um, it's fastest on the outside. It's slowest on the inside. That's why you get more erosion on the outside. That's how you get oxbow lakes and stuff like that. Um, but the net result of this is, you know, boats are all over the place with no rhyme or reason. It's complete chaos and madness and only tempered by the fact that, well, boats are pretty slow. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like, it's... Uh under steam, and it's like paddle steamers and stuff, but even so, like, you get in daylight, and generally, like, you have enough kind of, like, room to get out of the way of shit, right? Yeah, I mean, the river's pretty wide in most places, um, especially anywhere where you're going to be going fast. 
Yeah, and the Thames like fast, isn't like a know, very like fast knots. moving river either. Um, yeah, like it, it it'll drown you if you fall into it. But like to actually like to to drive a boat on, it's you know pretty sedate as I understand. Yeah, now I need to talk about pollution. Yeah. Okay, we'll just spend an hour on this slide. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shit used to be nasty. Um, Quite literal. Real bad. Yeah, I mean, basically, London's sort of like uh, sewage solution for the longest time was throw it in the river. Throw it in one of several rivers. Um, one of several, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, some of those rivers, like the fleet, just became sort of like garbage canals that just like open sewers that fed into the Thames. Um, and the Thames became this kind of like fetid, like solid waste dump. Um, which ultimately got to the it's it's sort of like apex, it's nadir, uh, depending on how you view these things, uh, in eighteen fifty eight when uh too much shit um got real nasty. Uh, the great the, stink the, the great stink of eighteen fifty eight. Yeah, the smell oh, on a hot yeah. day was so untenable. Parliament had to move out of its building. Mm hmm And Went to somewhat Oxford, I want to say. Yeah. Um the Queen was complaining. Um, so after that, the city fathers decided something must be done. Mm. This was also in tandem with an earlier discovery by Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, who <laughs> of discovered how, discovered how cholera was transmitted in yeah, 1854. The Broad Street epidemic. Uh, yes. a fantastic piece of sort of like, um, like epidemic detective work. Be yes. like ev everybody who got cholera like used this fucking this one water pump. It's amazing what you can achieve by knocking on doors and asking people questions. Sometimes, yeah, just bother people, <laughs> and it turns yeah. out, you know, uh, of of such things as civilization made. So something has to be done in order to move three million people's poop away from where yeah. those three million people live, mm. right? And this leads to the. Construction of the northern and southern outfalls, which is the sort of system of massive brick tunnels and cast iron pipes, all of these all discharged, all the sewage, seven miles downriver near Barking, mm. thereby making the sewage somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Barking and Dagenham's, um, yes. although now London has sort of like grown to include them. Um, and because these people were Victorians, because they hired Victorians, uh, most notably Joseph Bazalgette, um, mm -hmm. they they were serious about this, and they knew what they were about. And what they were about was creating a kind of like series of secular temples to sanitation. You know, like the so, just I like because this you're cult. I'm into this cult. Yeah, just because yeah. you're dealing in like solid human waste doesn't mean that you can't make it be uh, uplifting and edifying. Right, and so uh, a lot of the infrastructure of the, both the sewers and the sort of like the pumping stations and all of this is like very, very elaborate and very decorative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you got all the the nice ironwork by uh, Charles Henry Driver. Um, even like the big beam steam engines are highly ornamented. All that very that was very typical for the time for pretty much any steam engine, mm. stationary ones at least. Um, Architecturally, it's very, very pretty, um, but it is pumping sewage. You know, these are big tanks full of poop. Yeah, it's a um, big, like poop cathedral. Smells yeah, horrible it's... in there, but you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this sewage was discharged into the river twice a day as the tide was going out, thereby sweeping it down river. Yeah, one big collective flush. Um, yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it's like stored in in like you know the big the big systems, and then like at a certain time of day. You know, big sort of like horn goes off. Goes. Everyone in Barking sort of like uh, is traumatized as three million Londoners shit and piss. Yeah, Plus, a someone bunch of, like... pulls the someone pulls the plunger on the giant toilet. Yeah. <laughs> the big yeah. shit, just the big, yeah. big mm -hmm. massive toilet. What if we created a, a turd so big even God couldn't flush it down? Yeah, a lot yeah, of this it's... is industrial waste too. If you've seen those skibbity toilet uh, videos, oh, this Christ. is the real thing. Yeah. <laughs> Get off yeah. TikTok. I, I should also say, yeah, like uh, a, a lot of this is just like industrial effluent because the the sewer system is like, yeah, you know, so, some of that's going in there too. Um, right. th that was also something that we were dumping straight into the river. 
uh, in like relatively central London as well. Um, Think about all the stuff that you don't want at a slaughterhouse or a tannery. Yeah. All that stuff Ugh. has gone straight through all these beautifully designed Victorian pumps. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, this, this sewage outflow system was completed by 1875. The river in the city was cleaned up considerably. It was still not clean, right, by any means, but it's no. much cleaner. So yeah, it's, I not mean, like, it's, it's uh, not clean now. Is the thing. First of all, the Thames is... It's an ugly river. There's no, there's no getting away from it. It's a, it's a very Aww. like silty river. Even when it's clean, it looks brown. Um, the sort of the the wildlife that's in it is not appealing. It's like eels and shit like that. Um, it's not like these other European capitals where you know, like Paris, they're on track to have the uh, the river swimmable by like two years from now. <laughs> I mean, people have swum the Thames, but I don't recommend uh -oh. it. I've um, swum in the Anacostia River in Washington D.C. I mean, it's doable. You shouldn't do it. And I yeah, did it accidentally. Don't, there he don't, was. Don't do that. It's the wrong um, end of a canoe. Oh, no, yeah. Fuck. yeah, it's it, it, it's it's cleanish now. Yeah, but um, mm. you know, in in 1875, it's it's cleanish ish. You know, cleanish ish. It won't -ish. it won't immediately kill you if you fall in. Mm, yeah, I mean, the, my yeah. my favorite Thames fact right now is that all of the eels are on cocaine because Londoners do so much cocaine, God. and enough of that still goes into the river that it gets into the eels, and uh, there's there's we are coked up eels. <laughs> Britain's amazing. So they also got okay. They got they still got the smog and the air pollution. Those are big issues and illegal mm -hmm. dumping, so on and so forth. The city was considerably more tolerable to be in at this point, though. You know, and this is why municipal sanitation is very important. And this is why you know, like New York City sanitation guys have cool dress uniforms. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. You know, and we this don't is why get our sanitation guys cool uniforms at all, which I think is a missed trick. No, you get cool buildings. You don't get cool uniforms. Mm, yeah. Now, another thing we have to talk about is the pleasure garden. Ah. Ooh. We invented the middle class um, yeah. in the 19th century, and the middle class needs to distinguish itself by doing leisure. Um, yes. And, you know, people, people like new stuff. They like new things. So. Yeah, so not, not everyone's working 28 hours a day in the factories. And even some of the people who are, they do occasionally get a day off to spend with the family, right? And they have a, a little bit of disposable income, right? They need something to do. Um, there's no television. There's no radios. There's book books, but books are boring. Um, so yeah, there's there's music halls, but those are like uh, bawdy and like dens of iniquity. And especially if you're a Victorian and you have the money to like organize and build things, what you want to build is something that's going to be improving. Mm hmm. So you got to get a pleasure garden and you can go on a nice trip there to see and to be seen, take in the fresh air, have a nice walk around. Some of these things are like small tea gardens. Some of them are very large affairs with like concert halls, hundreds of acres of grounds, formal gardens, restaurants, follies, fountain, gazebos, and of course, bear pits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Listen, it wouldn't be a 19th century attraction without some animal cruelty. Yes. Um, I, I should also say that the, the main form of uh, like activity of entertainment here is not like sitting on your fat ass, right? It is promenading, which is something that has like... Standing on your fat ass. Walking, walking on your fat ass. Walking on, walking your, fat on ass. your fat ass, yes. Y you, and, you and the wife and children wearing your like Sunday best walk up and down this like sort of uh, tree-lined avenue, uh, you know, looking as good as you can, and sort of like uh, being being seen and judging the appearance of others, and you just do this for God knows how long. It's a it's like real real like bygone form of entertainment, you know. Um, yes, you it's uh, it's sort of the opposite of a lazy river. <laughs> yeah, you don't, like, you don't really do this anymore of just like walking up and down and just sort of like it, your social thing being like running into your friends, but also like, you know, talking shit about people uh, yeah. and, you know, maybe seeing uh, some like street entertainment. I still do that. I love to walk around and talk shit. 
Yeah, but I you're think, not doing I think it maybe in like we a should formalized. Bring this, yeah, we should bring this back. Speak for yourself, Alice. <laughs> yeah. A kind of like walking tour thing, yeah. Yeah. So these things are, most of them are for-profit affairs, right? They charge some kind of entry fee. They advertise <laughs> most of the... It's like at Disney World. Pay yeah. money to walk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Most of the successful ones were located near some form of public transportation. And moving people back and forth from London to the various pleasure gardens was big business. Both the railways and the steamship lines competed for passengers. Oh, yeah, this is fantastic if you're a railway. You know, because it gets you gets you tickets on like on the weekends. Um, you know, if you're sort of like trying to get those commuter fares, you can you can get some more by like taking people to to go and like walk up and down the like sort of uh, promenade. Yeah, and this sort of fell out of fashion at the beginning of the twentieth century. Most of these had closed down by then, which is supposedly well, I have a question. Of, Were these also built in the way that like? railways here or inner cities would build you know theme parks and shit was it that system or, or a little different you know i'm not actually sure because i think a lot of them predated uh the railways that were built to them but certainly they acted in the same way as a revenue revenue generator gotcha mm. you know because you had to buy your ticket both to the pleasure garden but also on the railway or steamship that brought you there yeah, right. But this this is, is something that sort of went out of fashion by you know the twentieth century. Um, just I, I'm not even sure why exactly because it, it seemed like they Stay were home they were post you know yeah well they were gone before like the radio existed. Um, you know yeah I, just, I, I, I there mu- there had to be like ten twenty years there where just everyone sat inside bored. <laughs> <laughs> the lost decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I don't know. I think some of it might be down to the like the history of the respectable theater, um, where that be, you know becomes something that's accessible to you. You can go to like a concert hall that isn't a music hall, um, that's in an, a city that's in London. You know, um, I should look up when the when the Royal Albert Hall was built. But this is all me speculating. You know, yeah, it's, it's we should have got a historian like, on for this. Yeah, yeah, that that would have been smart. Um, you know, it's like okay, we, you know, we. But they had like concert halls in these gardens too. Like you could go mm. see, you could go see the latest Gilbert and Sullivan operetta in there. Um, <laughs> be like, oh man, this is really topical. I'm sure they won't still be staging this in you know, a hundred years, a hundred and forty years. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. So this is. Ranelay Gardens, Ranelay Gardens. This yeah, is now Ranley, yeah. Ranley, yeah. It's now the site of uh, Chelsea Hospital. Oh, um, yeah. Okay, next yeah. to the National Army Museum. Cool. Yeah, yeah. exactly. W- walked past here then. Now another another thing that was fueling these steamship companies was the seashore. Yeah, different kind of promenading. You can promenade Brit- up and down this bitch as well. Yeah, Britain's world class beaches. <laughs> Such yeah. that they are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see why when uh, cheap air travel became a thing, and you could just go to Magaluf. You see why every British person decided to do that constantly. This is why every penny spent on reinforcing the dunes at New Jersey's beaches is a penny well spent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't want to wind up with this. No, um, it's it's real bad. Uh, Brighton people will get mad at me, but beaches beaches suck. We have sandy beaches in Britain, but they're all in like fucking Cornwall or northeast Scotland, where they're like arctically cold. And Donald Trump has mm. built a golf course next to them. Um, yeah. In general, I would say uh, the the sort of like median seaside resort is Brighton, Scarborough. Uh, someone like that, where it's like, yeah, what what you're meant to do is you check into like a nice kind of like chocolate box hotel that overlooks the promenade, and then you promenade for a bit. Uh, that and, sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Th- those things also did not really survive the 20th century. Um, you can still do it in Atlantic City. Oh, you, you can sure can, Brighton, buddy. But y- yeah, but... you can you can go down a pier and you can see an extremely racist comedian who won't be able to perform anywhere else. You know, mm. 
Because of wokeness. Because yeah. of wokeness. Because of wokeness. Now, the other thing, the other thing people went down to the seashore for was, of course, the ozone. Ah, yeah. O3. O3. That's normal oxygen has two O's, but this has three. That makes it one better. Smells bad. Yeah. Uh, some people think it smells pure and like mm -hmm. sanitary, right? Mm -hmm. And because of this, there were a lot of perceived health benefits to ozone. And these were entirely mythological, driven mainly because of the smell. I mean, Victorians loved a sort of like quack health cure, and you know, entirely, entirely reasonable for doctors to prescribe you like go spend a week at the seaside or you know go up a sanatorium in the mountains or whatever because the air is purer there, which is you know if you live in London is absolutely going to be true, uh, just yeah. because there's fewer people and fewer industries and stuff. You but tell you what, it would, it would shit it, air, right? Mm. It, 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 you know, if it were a nice seashore, it would certainly improve my mood, which, you know, is sometimes half the half the battle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is that if you have tuberculosis, your mood is not half the battle. Half the battle That's is true. tuberculosis That's true. and the other half is tuberculosis. <laughs> uh, so, it's, I, I prefer Swiss cheese lug. Yes. Mm. I want to say mm. this was originally something that Mountaineers said. Is that you know the ozone makes me feel better and so on and so Bloody forth. Germans they, read the Magic Mountain, you know. Then they, then they Germans you know. who are Italians and possibly also uh, <laughs> whatever other ethnicity. yeah read Magic Reinhold Mountain. Messner's novel, The Magic Mountain. But the way the human body detects ozone is through smell, and the smell at the seashore smells like ozone, but it's not. It's an olfactory illusion driven by marine life. <sighs> just like you're smelling various kinds of algaes and I don't know, shrimp poop. Gross. Uh, <laughs> mm. I, I don't like the way the seaside there's, smells. There's smells no like ozone at the seaside. <laughs> it's not actually there. Yeah, but like, presumably this doesn't stop you from opening a hotel called, you know, Professor Quack's Ozonatorium or whatever. <laughs> yeah, or and like having a whole, skimming a whole... bunch of money off of people whole neighborhood in New York City called Ozone Park right next to the beach. Um, huh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, throughout the, the 19th and early 20th century, going down to the shore and taking the ozone was a popular pastime for if you were chronically ill, if you were acutely ill, or if you're just a health nut. Even with and, increasing and, and scientific had tuberculosis, which yeah. was not helping your yeah. yeah, and I'm going to say that yeah. that that covered about a hundred percent of the Victorian population. <laughs> yes, and and the other thing is that this was simultaneous with increasing scientific evidence that ozone was actually extremely bad for you. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I mean, like, an, sort of absolute, particularly Victorian Britain, nation of hypochondriacs. Yeah. <laughs> Nation of hypochondriacs who also had unrelated a lot of serious things yeah, wrong yeah, with they them. Yeah, they had, they had every disease they didn't think they had. Yeah, just like, absolutely, <laughs> like, huge amounts of, like, lead consumption, uh, you know, fucking antimony in the bread and stuff, and they're like, yeah. I don't have enough ozone, uh, I'm, I'm fucked, it's over, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, the, the, got bread, yes. Yeah. The, the set of diseases years. you think you have does not intersect with the set of diseases you have, and both mm. are very large sets. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, how do you get down to the seaside? Well, you could take a train, but you could also take a boat. No. Oh, don't do that. Yeah. Um, like the, 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 the sort of very low-energy flag that's just Princess Alice. Yes. Uh, I get one of these. So flying one of these from the Jack stuff. So one of the companies that was providing transportation to the Pleasure Gardens in the distant seashore was the London Steamboat Company, which uh very descriptive. I mean, listen, so it does what it says on the tin. These days, something called the London Steamboat Company makes, like, alcohol-free IPAs. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ask me about the hotel I stayed in uh, one time in Glasgow that was, like, in the uh, former headquarters of the Anchor Line and which had a bunch of anchor line like themed stuff, despite the fact that it was a hotel and not a steamship company. 
uh, or the hotel in London that's like in the sea containers building and has a bunch of sea containers shit, despite being a hotel and not the headquarters of a company that trades in sea containers. Damn. I would kind of like those hotels though. I like uh, sucker for a themed hotel. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, the real question is: When you get the merchandise, are they using the? Uh, are they? Are they selling you merchandise of twenty foot and forty foot containers? Are they using the actual sea containers, thirty five foot containers? Ah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's something I would be pedantic about. Um, <laughs> You're pedantic about a lot of stuff, bud. Well, that's true. That's why we have this <laughs> podcast. That's um, sort of an outlet for pedantry. Yes, exactly. This is so I don't do it in social situations. <laughs> <laughs> in my case, it funds the ability to do it in social situations. So, this company, the London Steamboat Company, provided service from London to Kent, Essex, and Suffolk via the Thames and some connecting railways, because not all the railways made it to London. Mm. Um, th there's a reason why these were able to compete, and it's because the railways... They were good. They weren't necessarily that good. Sometimes a uh, regular speed steamship could, you know, get you there in as much time or at least in better conditions than the railways could. Yeah. Plus, if you ignore the fact that, you know, all the turds floating past you, right? It's the, the, the romance, nice scenic, the aesthetic. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah exactly. You're, nice trip. Yeah. You're inhaling so much ozone, we assume. Yes. You, you're not, but like you, you'll feel like you are. Oh, maybe. you are. And it's worse as it turns yeah. out. <laughs> So they have this fleet of large river boats, right, that were capable of carrying up to about 1,000 people. But the popularity of the service was so great that trips were frequently overbooked and the ships overloaded. Yeah. But, you know, money is money, and uh, listen, it's a river, right? Sure. What's the worst that's going to happen? Right. I mean, certainly uh, you wouldn't, like, buy good, more Good ships. thing we, we're not a disasters podcast. No. Yeah. Good thing we're a success podcast. That's right. A, a, a podcast about business success and making yourself smarter. Yeah, so pictured here is the SS Princess Alice. Two hundred. It was a little bit insulting to name a boat after a woman. You know, like, you know, I've, I've often thought that it would be a little insulting to be compared to the massive boat. Um, but bo boats, are, boats are female, though. Yeah, why? I mean, in Russian, they're not. Uh, in Russian, a That's boat true. is a he. The boat yeah. is a man in Russian, yes. Mm. Gender can be language-specific. Gender is whatever you want it to be. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is so, this boat. The Princess Alice was 219 feet long, 20 feet at the beam. <laughs> you see Four why I think it's insulting. Yeah. <laughs> 432 gross tons. Oh, but yeah, mm, yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> two two side paddle wheels, two large steam boilers, rated to carry nine hundred and sixty four people. Yeah, uh, also true. Um, um good lord, Alice. Built as P.S. Butte in Greenock, Scotland. Greenock. Um, Greenock. Yes, but Clyde built, unsurprisingly, because uh, that's where they built all the ships. Um, it was built in 1865. It was used in Scotland for two years, presumably fending off dozens of lake monster attacks. <laughs> Actually, I presumably think it, doing a variation of the same thing of of carrying people like Dune the Water, of like taking people from like Glasgow to um, you know the various like seaside resorts where you can promenade in the freezing cold. I want to say it was actually owned by a railway of some kind and did sort of. Um, some kind of coastal service on mm. the west coast there. I, but I, I, I forget. Islands, I didn't. You know. Yeah, I did not put service to Mull or something. Yeah, I did not put that in the notes. But it was bought by the London Steamboat Company for the pleasure garden trade. And gave many years of good service. One time, it even carried the Shah of Persia. Wow. Oh. Yeah. So this was sometimes colloquially known as the Shah's boat because uh, you know yeah. the. Dining out on that one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, one time the Shaw was here. Now, <laughs> one thing oh, is... never let it go. No. Yeah. This is like my friend's friend who is pretty sure that Joe Biden once used his toilet. <laughs> <laughs> what? He bought a house from someone who was a family friend of Joe Biden. 
Uh, oh, okay. So not like in his presence, not like Joe Biden like oh, knocked yeah, on his door. Like, Biden can just can I use oops, your sort of shit? Yeah. Just like no, Joe Biden has previously used this toilet. I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Plausible. I, I the mean, presidential unless, cloning program begins. Yes. Unless Biden is like one of those people who, um, uh, wait a second, I know something related to the the presidential cloning program through through poops, which is that. When he stayed in the Soviet Union, Churchill's staff were like very worried about the concept of the Soviets like capturing their bosses' turds in order to, I guess, right. like learn about his health. Which it's Winston Churchill; the health is not going to be good. Um, yeah, yeah, that, but you just look at the guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, apparently this was the thing that the Soviets maybe sometimes did was like you know the gonna gonna get like a full workup of various sort of world leaders. Shit. From... God bless. Yeah, so... Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is, you give us two bucks a month, and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but, you know, it's two bucks, you get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes, so you can learn about exciting topics like guns, pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision, and we respect that. Back to the show. So uh, one thing I noticed about this, uh, this, this, this picture here is that it seems to make the boat look a lot bigger than it was. Um, hmm. I don't think this is the same boat because I can't, or at least I can't definitively say this is the same boat because Pinterest is ruined image search. Oh, That's right. Don't, yeah, don't even. Yeah. It, um, Pinterest and um, uh, the fucking file format thing. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. WebP w or whatever. WebP. WebP and like ImageP have like fucking ruined uh, image search. But uh, also, now that I'm looking at this, I'm like, maybe this is a little bit too small, so it's somewhere in the middle. Um, these aren't huge boats, they're just designed to pack as many people on as possible. Oh, it's okay. like standing room only, unless you're like yeah. in the sort of like actual they got structure like, of it. They got like seats. fore and aft uh, outside benches, they also have seating actually on a lower deck, uh, they got a saloon, they got seating on the roof. Love a saloon, um, love that it's not a bar. No, nah, it's a saloon. Full of cowboys. It's got yeah. the like swing doors. Boat cowboys. No, no, yes. no in Brit in Britain, a saloon is fancy. Mm. Um, you barely see a saloon anymore. Oh. Yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, they they got rid of those. They replaced them with pubs. Mm. Yeah. Well, t t time was that the pub would have a saloon or would have a snug, uh, which Ooh. would be a, a, like a distinct, like slightly fancier area of the pub, as distinct from the bar, um, where you could like go and like you know sit down and sort of like drink and maybe get something to eat in like a slightly a, more rarefied atmosphere. You got a saloon, you got a retiring room, you got the uh mm. what are the other what are the other rooms that you had? Um Ozone Spa. I was yeah, exactly. Well that's that's just the upper deck. Yeah. Um so anyway, I it, it it's something like this. It's not very big. Um but it can look big if you want it to. Uh <laughs> Sure, it's it, it's sure. it's like a passenger paddle steamer, and uh, you know, in in the grand scheme of things, you know, uh, there's there's larger boats going up and down the Thames all the time. Um, yeah, but you know, also uh, smaller ones. The other thing to note is uh, very low, what you would call a uh, freeboard here. Mm. Um, you know, the actual the actual um, distance between the deck <laughs> the, the, and the, the water. Song. Yeah. So it's 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 low to the water in general, as opposed to our second contestant oh, in, in in the red corner. World's worst game show. Yes. Yeah. Who's gonna die on the Thames today? Yeah. So with London being 
you know, still acting as his, in his traditional role as the consumer of last resort. Mm. Of course, you know, there's lots of trade on the river, and that includes lots of big ships. Um, and some of it was coal. Bulk carriers to carry bulk. Um, I mean, you, you need to burn a lot of coal to keep the, uh, you know, keep the air as bad as it is and keep up the demand for the sort of ozone resorts. So, yes, but uh, weirdly, uh, SS Bywell Castle was designed for exporting coal, not importing it. Ah, um, although so coal's from Newcastle. I, I looked at a couple of sources here, and I couldn't quite get it straight whether it was just a ship that frequently carried coal or if it was built for coal it seems like this was sort of built as something that could do break bulk and bulk just as well and weirdly had a few passenger cabins apparently not very popular with the passengers yeah you don't um, say the, 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 the track <laughs> covered in coal dust um, yes so all right this one big tall ship um 254 feet, 3 inches long, 32 feet of beam, uh, draft of 19 feet, 6 inches, uh, assessed at 1,376 gross tons. Mostly uh, named after a castle rather than a woman. Um, yes, SS Bywell Castle. Um, so you could do it the entire time, we just, you know. Yeah, choose not to. Yeah. yeah, so I had a compound steam engine developing a whopping 120 horsepower. Wow! Yeah, but going going back to the old numbers on on like horsepower is always really fun to be like, yeah, this is we assume enough to 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 like it's, it's as much as anyone's ever going to need. It's like a huge industrial engine, 120 horse. Well, the thing yeah. is, you know, it's a steam engine. It's it's a, it's a compound powering this fucking yeah. thing. It's a compound steam engine, so it uses the steam twice in two different cylinders, right? Um, and because it's a steam engine. Even though it doesn't have much horsepower, it has infinite torque. Mm. <laughs> Just like dragging this fucking collier through the water, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, well, there's, there's no power, but sometimes I, the way the steam engine, like the, the relationship between horsepower and torque is sometimes confusing because, yeah, this was more than sufficient to move this thing. Um, <laughs> it had a screw propeller. Um, it was built 1869 to 1870 at Jero on the River Tyne for Hall Brothers. Mm. Um, and unlike the Princess Alice, this was an ocean-going vessel, regularly making voyages as far as South America and India and so on and so forth. Delivering like upwards of like four miserable passengers and a shitload of coal. A lot of coal. <laughs> and coming Can you imagine back being with... one of those passengers? My roommate's just a big lump of anthracite. Just like yeah. this was the cheapest cabin available anywhere. It's sort of the Ryanair of its day, you know. They made me a stoker for dead two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody works. Yeah. <laughs> um, Probably a fantastic way to go on the run, though. Like if you want yeah, to escape true. London in a hurry, uh, yeah. why why wait that... around to join the French Four Legion when you can simply be a stoker? I believe its its most frequent route was between London and Alexandria in Egypt. Mm. Now this ship had a hell of a service history um, because it like wound up saving the crews of like a half a dozen foundering vessels on the open seas. Um, you know, it 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 just happened to come across wrecks all the time. It's like, all right, everyone off. We're gonna go get the guys. God damn it. I how has this right, happened again? <laughs> right place at the right time, and then yes. all those guys get to share the horrible cabins. Yeah, they all yeah, get to all be right. stokers. Bad news, you're a stoker now. We're gonna get <laughs> up to 130 horsepower. <laughs> the good news is you have been rescued. The bad news is you have to live in the coal scuttle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was it was it was usually used outbound for coal or no. I'm not sure what it was used for coal in this case. I, again, the sources conflict on this, um, but it definitely was used for things other than coal. Um, and apparently the voyages on this thing were pretty rough. Um, the passengers did not like it. Mm. I mean, bulk yeah. carriers, you would think generally they, they're pretty stable, right? By design, yeah. pretty, pretty big, pretty sedate. So I don't know what's up with the design of this one. 
other yeah. than it's trying to be like neither fish nor fowl. You know, it's not a yeah. bolt carrier. It's not a, like a a break bolt carrier. It's just well, it's also compared to like a, a ship of today, it's not that big. Mm. Uh, mm. two hundred and fifty four feet. Eh. Uh, for for that's seventy seven and a half meters. Um, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like a huge thing. It's gonna get tossed around a bit, you know. Sure. So anyway, on the 3rd of September, 1878, oh oh no. SS Princess Alice was making a moonlight trip from Swan Pier, that's just upstream of London Bridge, mm-hmm. right? As indicated here by the red dot. Don't confuse it with Tower Bridge over here. That Same. wasn't built yet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that will do it. And it was going to go down the River Thames to the Pleasure Gardens at Gravesend, and then on to Sheerness, which is yeah. on the sea. And is, is not nice, Sheerness. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's just like sort of my modern prejudice as to what, what it's been sort of like turned into now, but yeah. That, that was is... the beautiful world-class beach I showed a picture of earlier. Oh, Ooh, okay. That's nice. beach. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Mm. Left in the morning, it was going to return at night. Uh, points of interest along the line including included Rosherville Gardens and Gravesend, and of course, Rosherville Gardens Bear Pit. <laughs> oh, right? check, out, check out the bear, you know? Yeah, do you want to see a bear in a pit? That's like Edible a fun suffering time. is great. Hell yeah. yeah. We took this bear, we put it in a pit. He's miserable. He's so are you, just you like looking at this poor, poor, like, abused bear, just like, you know, I think he might need some more ozone. We need to dig a bear pit at the seashore. <laughs> Take the bear to the sea. Take the bear to the sea. <laughs> we took a pit and put a bear in it. Just, that, that was that was entertainment for hundreds of years, you know. Yeah. And now we now we invented podcasts. Yeah. No, we're the bears in the pit. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> us. So becoming increasingly concerned about my ozone levels. The whole also journey. TV, sorry. Yeah. Mm. The whole journey was just under fifty miles each way, and a round trip ticket was a whopping two shillings. It's sort of like a, it's, it's a moderate amount, you know. This is yeah, not something that not... you drop casually, but it's like for if you're a sort of like middle income, if you're a clerk or something, yeah. that's you know respectable. Uh, these these tickets were fungible, right? So you could take any London steamboat company operated ship that day on that route route so you know you could get off one ship at gravesend get on another ship and go all the way to sheerness or you know you could so on and so forth it was the the ticket was valid for the whole day right Mm -hmm. now the first trip of the day went uneventfully everyone made it out for their special day trip to rosherville gardens for the families and the school children and out to Sheerness to take the healthful ozone for the elderly and infirm and the health nuts. There was no passenger manifest on this ship because of the way the ticketing was designed. No one knew how many people were on it and who they were. Oh, that seems like a good idea. But this is not like a boat full of, you know, hardened, experienced seamen, right? This is, (laughs) this is, uh, this is sort of, you know, it, it, Women, kids, and the elderly are disproportionately represented here. Sure. Oh, I feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about navigational lights. Ah, uh, no red port left in the bottle. Yes. So, in 1848, the Lord High Admiral required all British vessels to carry navigation lights. There's a red one on the port side. There's a green one on the starboard side. There's a white one on the mast. Uh, there's a white one on the stern that came later. Um, yeah, you're the, kind I, of like you're chiefly concerned with left and right here. Left uh, and right is the most important thing so people know where you're going. The idea here being that if it was pitch black out, you could still figure out which way a vessel was going so you didn't whack into it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We we still put these lights on on ships. We still put them on planes. Even put them on planes too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, today these are high powered LEDs or some co- other kind of lighting source. Back in the day, these are like oil lanterns with a colored gel. 
People people don't know how high powered those are. By the way, you can't. You got to be very careful testing aircraft uh, marking lights because uh, if you if you hit them with ground crew around them, you will blind someone. Um, oh. Yeah, oh, fun. Anyway, this is called Galleon's Reach. Incredible, is, incredible name. Uh, this section of river here. Um, a reach is a straight section of river between bends, right? So, you know, each, each section is some other reach, and I don't know what the other ones are, but this is the important one here. Sure. Yeah. How do I clear? I got to clear all this now, because now there's going to be more. Gareth told me how to do this, and I forgot. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, here we go. So, SS Bywell Castle was traveling with the tide and was thus close to the center of the river. Trying to get so a few extra knots by, by sailing in the fast bit, right? Yes. Um, so we're, that's going to be red. Uh, red. Uh, green. Okay. SS Princess Alice is traveling against the tide and was thus doing something more like this. We <laughs> and then was intending to do something like this because they had an intermediate stop right here near the Woolwich Ferry North Terminal, which at that point was not a ferry terminal. Maybe it could have done a donut though for the essential workers. To respect Captain Tom, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Woolwich, you know, by the way, uh, Woolwich. You don't pronounce anything as it's as it's spelled. Uh, you're nowhere near as bad as the French. Um, <laughs> so now with that in mind that's sort of the intended path I'm going to get rid of some of these markings um, so hold on I'm trying to select the right tool there we go no, I'm still on, I'm on the pen okay some of the some of the precise actions of folks on the bridge of the SS Princess Alice are unclear at this point for reasons that are going to become obvious in a second. Well, they hadn't invented the like cockpit voice recording phonograph yet. Yes, exactly. I don't think they'd even invented the phonograph. Damn. I mean, yeah. crazy. Um, the wax cylinder that uh, records the voices of the, the, like, the river pilot. Mm-hmm. Black wax cylinder, yes. They even have that? I you know, black I honestly don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about half past seven. It's very dark. It's hard to judge distances right now, right? Mm. Um September, night's closing in. Uh yeah. plus, you know, uh, London is in a big sort of mire of coal dust. Yeah, coal dust, smog. You know, they had the pea soup fog where they're like actual little particles floating around. Ugh. Yeah. Captain Thomas Harrison of SS Bywell Castle was unfamiliar with the river. Oh, that's what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. So he hired an experienced river pilot. That actually Christopher is what you Dix. want to hear. That's what you want to hear. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, he, he didn't even have to do it. He was not required to do it. He was like, let's do this by the but not even let's do this by the book. Let's use extra caution here. Beyond the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he hired an experienced pilot named Christopher Dix. That's, that's that Dix with an experienced seaman X. named Dix, yes. An experienced seaman named Dix, yes, to navigate. And so Dix sighted the port, that's the red lights, of the Princess Alice coming around the corner into Galleon's Reach. And, um, right... As such, he assumed there would be a standard, normal, port-to-port -port crossing, right? He was going to turn starboard to give them some room. Yeah, you kind of, like, yield because they're going to, like, cut across you. Yeah. Which is what they want to do, too. Yeah, exactly. That's what they wanted to do, yeah. Um, now, Captain William Grinstead of SS Princess Alice is trying to get the dock in Wool Woolwich as quick as possible. As such, he is taking the racing line. Now, oh, so boy. as Bywell Castle 
moves over to starboard. This is probably not the right arrow right here. I should draw this something that gets us closer to the site of the incident. Um, so as they're turning to make room, he's trying to keep in the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, um, the slack water, the slack water. Yes. I'm, I'm not that good with nautical terms. Uh, okay. yeah, he's trying to stay in the slack water and is thus turning to port. Right. Oh boy. Yeah. Even though the other ship is bearing down on him. So he, he wants to keep on the, the south bank of the river. Yes. And then cut across later after uh Bywell Castle has passed him. Yes, and uh Bywell Castle assumes they're going straight on, so they are turning starboard to give them more room. Um so right, now they're going learn, never yield for anybody in traffic. <laughs> no, that's how yeah. I drive, baby. <laughs> Incon you call it inconsiderate, I call it defensive driving. Yeah. So right at the last second, um, the SS Princess Alice uh takes a very hard starboard turn to try and get out of the way. Um hold on, port turn, excuse me. I I'm not that good at this. Well, doing well, good, bud. Yeah, this is the so, thing. It's it's if it's difficult for us to remember the difference between our left and our right, um, it's probably harder to do in the dark in motion, even if you've been doing it for your entire career. This is um, also actually something that comes into play when the uh, media covers this, but we'll get into that in a couple slides. Mm. Um, and. Uh, well, Bywell Castle isn't quite able to get out of their way, and it's full of coal. You know, it's a yeah. big fucking, it's a big honking uh, sort of uh, cargo ship. And so, um, in this highly pixelated image, uh, the two ships collided at a very slight angle, something about fifteen degrees, right? Oh, um, so it's just gonna like plowed like into and down. Right. Yeah, so it's like if you imagine um we have the big ship here, right? Uh and the little ship is like here. Right? Mm, sure. So, you know, you might think they would bump off of each other, but that's not what happened. Um the bow of the Bywell Castle wrecked into the Princess Alice just forward of the paddle wheels which it's rumored to have been a weak point in the vessel, but that probably didn't matter. It's like made of wood, you know? It's like not... <laughs> yeah, for sure. And like the bow, strongest part, you, you just like, you, you have rammed it, essentially. Yeah, so essentially it rams straight through oh. um, the Princess Alice and actually breaks it nearly clean in half. A bunch of like um, sort of Carthaginian naval commanders from the Punic Wars, sort of watching just this, cheering, and just like yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I did it. <laughs> like painting a big sort of like atropopeic, That's not the word. Uh, like um, a big like evil eye on the front of the Bywell Castle. Yeah. You know? So it uh, the Princess Alice like wrapped around the bow of the Bywell Castle. Broken Ooh. two, reared up and sank Fuck in four me. minutes. Jesus. Okay. I mean, that's quick. Y y you're not getting a kind of like safety briefing when you get on no. the Princess Alice, I imagine. You just no, find I... what you hope is a seat that's not covered in poop. And... Yeah. <laughs> Most of the passengers were not on deck. They were in the saloon or in the cabins, right? They so have a... life jackets? They had, I want to say, a couple life preservers and two lifeboats. Oh, perfect. Cool. Yeah, there's no time to evacuate or to call for an evacuation, you know? Uh, and so, uh, essentially, everyone below deck drowned instantly, right? There's very few survivors. Right. Um, those who were lucky enough to make it into the water, because they were in a spot on the boat without a roof over it, um, they had more problems because no one knew how to swim. Of course, the women, right. the women were wearing those big frilly dresses that make you sink like yes. a rock. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, everyone's wearing like a lot of heavy wool clothing apart from anything else. Yes. The crew of Bywell Castle immediately lowered their lifeboats to try and rescue everyone. Those on deck still threw anything that could float into the water, including, I think, chicken coops. Uh, <laughs> you're just like, you're, you're like, you're in the water, uh, the water is full of turds, and then a guy throws a chicken coop at you and it hits you in the wow, head. And you, you drown that feeling confused, <laughs> betrayed, uh, and like stinking of shit, and like with a massive a like chicken coop go, in, in dude. your head. Yeah, and, and this is. Um, a legacy of, uh, you know, we can see here in this modern image, you will note this line here. This is the path of the northern outflow. Oh boy. Which had begun in the previous hour, since the tide was going out, discharging half of London's entire stock of sewage into exactly this part of the river. Oh boy. Oh yes. Yes. <laughs> the, wor- yeah. the worst place it's for the this shit to happen. One. Yeah. 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 Oh. So if you did make it into the water, even if you were a strong <laughs> swimmer, even if you were you hadn't drowned, you were now completely submerged in doo-doo ass. <laughs> and like like abattoir blood and like tannery piss and like yeah, God knows what kind of chemicals. Three trillion types of horrible chemicals. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's not enough ozone in the world to compensate <laughs> no, yeah, for that. That shit ain't not coming yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. That ain't coming out. Ooh. So it's hard to get the death toll. It's even harder to figure out how many people survived. But it's I, somewhere between... I mean, listen, I survived this. I'm taking showers that last the rest of my life, and I'm not telling a fucking soul. Yeah. Um, right. I, I, I did read one thing about this, that, like, generally speaking, when they were able to, like, find uh, bodies in the wreckage, it's like, uh, sort of beneath the, beneath the waterline, uh, or beneath the roof even, it's just like people like absolutely like stuffed into uh, like doorways and stuff because the first thing they know about it is the the thing just collapses uh, and yeah you just drown so in, yeah, in well, drown in the poop yeah there might have been a crushing incident before people drowned my god um god, yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. that dude. fuck that but yeah of the more than seven hundred people aboard uh, somewhere between like. 30 and 130 survived. I'm very confused about the actual like amount of survivors here. Again, that seems to be different in different sources. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, classic Victorian shit, especially with the press as it was, you know? Oh, the press are about to fuck this up bad. Um, <laughs> you could, you was... could also do the reverse. There's an interesting bit about this in um, uh, Hallie Rubenhold's book, The Five, about uh, the, the victims of Jack the Ripper. Uh, where one of the one of them is a sort of a con woman who notably steals valor, who lies about having survived this. Um, if like in order to be a more effective beggar, she's like, yeah, no, I, I was on the like Princess Alice, and she wasn't. Damn. Well, uh, again, there's no passenger manifest, thus there's no great way to actually actually estimate the number of fatalities. But uh, somewhere between 600 and like 750 people or so uh, were killed mm. pretty much instantly. This all occurred less than 800 feet from shore. Oh. Jesus, yeah. I mean, the Thames isn't even like a particularly deep river either. It's, it's a- yeah, it's not that deep. It's something that if, if, if you were like an okay, okay swimmer today, you could probably do it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> maybe not with the kind of like constant not with battering turd. waves of turds, but like battering waves of turds. I mean, the big <laughs> thing was people were trapped in the saloon. Mm. Yeah, that's that is kind of how I want to go down. At least trapped in a saloon. <laughs> <laughs> so there are like, uh, you know, the, the the rescue effort is largely over within like. 10 minutes or so it, it was not there were very few survivors to pick up if you made it into the water and you weren't wearing a frilly dress that pulled you to the bottom immediately um and you didn't succumb to horrible sewage 
uh, the lifeboats of the Bywo Castle picked you up, or you swam to shore. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, like the sister sure. ship of the Princess Alice was like there like, in like ten, 10 minutes, minutes after. Yeah, yeah there's right. no one, no one left to rescue. Uh, yeah. There are these like amazing stories of escape, which may or may not be tall tales. One guy claims that when the bow of the Princess Alice reared up when it was sinking, he was right at the top and simply stepped off the bow of the Princess Alice onto the bow of the Bywell Castle. <laughs> Hell yeah. Didn't Never got get wet. Your feet wet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ideal. <laughs> that's that's such a like I would simply you know think, I'm, think I'm built different, different right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was one guy on that boat who truly was built different. <laughs> Look, sometimes when the boat is going up, you got to know when to climb over the railing. Yeah, <laughs> Devon, do you know what your ancestors were doing in the sort of like uh, mid nineteenth century? <laughs> Um, the press arrived on the scene very quickly Mm. Um, and they immediately started you know uh, writing some whatever they could get out of the survivors and they're like oh Captain Harrison of uh, the Bywell Castle uh, just rammed the ship because he's incompetent right Uh, with no evidence you know he was like uh, and and you know, Harrison is there to defend himself. Grinstead on the Princess Alice was no longer there to testify because uh, he was dead. A quick um, way to lose a PR battle, I would yeah. say. Yeah, but he was winning the PR battle at this point. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> How do you lose a PR battle to a corpse? Well, I don't know. I don't know. You just, you just you just whacked just your wanted ship. it more. You just whacked your ship into... Uh, a ship full of um, whatchamacallit, women, children, and the elderly. Yeah. Um, plus, yeah. Good plus the like instinctive sort of like class sympathies of like this is the leisure class that uh, you know they're doing the sort of like they're getting the deserving reward for working hard in the paper factory. Uh, therefore, you know, and and this guy with his sort of like coal, just like this member yeah. of the laboring classes. Well, my yeah. understanding is that actually the uh, the the Princess Alice says more carrying. Um, sort of lower middle class and working class people. Mm. Um, you know, but maybe maybe the upper end of the working class here. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, cuz it, but it was it was still like okay, a coal ship wrecked into this passenger ferry and immediately murdered everyone and it's like, well, absent any other facts, I feel pretty strongly in favor of the passenger ship here. Sure, yeah. Uh, um so there's a recovery effort after this as part of like the investigation into what happens. The, bi- the big effort is to try and recover and identify bodies. Eventually, the authorities just offered five shillings for each body found. Mm. So, it's, so not bad for like grim bounty hunting. Yeah, so you just had some guys in rowboats who would go out in a river, get a big stick with a hook on the end, try and pick up some bodies. Cool. Uh, there's there's he, a detail about this too that I, I I find really upsetting, which is that um when they recovered bodies, often they were kind of like uh you know not just kind of like bloated in the way that people who have died and you know been been left in water are, but also um like covered in a kind of slime of like accumulated yeah. sewage and like river goop that was apparently like impossible to wash off, um. Gotta like, get some dawn, man. Yes, yeah. I think I, I think at some point when they brought him to the improvised mortuary, it was like, okay, we're gonna wash out. We're gonna try and wash off the faces. So we're not gonna worry about the rest of this, you know. Fuck, mm, God um, damn. Yeah. Also, because it was a bounty system, there were like arguments over who could who and fights the over yeah whose corpse was whose. Um, uh, just all very dignified. Yeah. yeah. That's the word uh, that Bywell, comes to mind, yes. Yeah. Mm. By the the Bywell Castle returned had returned upriver to Detford and was stuck there. Because other than the survivors, no one could disembark for fear of their lives. Jesus. It was said that someone on every street in East London had been lost in the accident. Hmm. Again, you see, you see why why you know people lied about it. So like East yeah. London nine eleven, 
Mm-hmm. All right, but this is a solid quarter of a 911 right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what we're using to measure things, that's you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we have we have nine eleven nine elevens. Well, apparently now the thing is you have to adjust the nine eleven for population. They have to do it proportionally. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So actually, this is probably a lot more than one nine eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord! Someone wants to do the maths on that one. Yeah, right? I was about to say go go in the comments, go do the math on that because I don't feel like doing that. Yeah, um, boy. Some folks who successfully made it out of the water began to die of strange diseases on account of full submersion into raw sewage. Horrible. Oh, horrible. Turbo sepsis. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or just poisoning from any number of the things that are just in there. Um, yeah. Attacked by cocaine eels. <laughs> Well, the thing, the problem with the cocaine eels is they have a lot of energy, you know. Yes, this is true. They got they they, they got more electricity in them. Mm, yeah, yeah. The wreck was raised and beached on September eighth to allow the search to continue properly. And they did. They just found a bunch of yeah. The corpses were just stacked up in the saloon. Oh. Um, and again, this river is shallow enough that raising this boat was like trivial yeah. yeah well yeah it was like it, it, it was not difficult at all they just sure. picked it up and beached it it was fine you know it's it it it, it happened so close to shore it's just astonishing that it was as bad as it was right although there's another disaster very similar to this we will discuss in a future episode general slocum um, sure general slocum yeah general slocum, mm. so Ultimately, there were two inquiries into the, the, the disaster, right? By the coroner and the board of trade, right? Mm. And there's a bunch of conflicting stories presented in the coroner's inquiry. There's differing accounts of the ship's paths. For instance, there was a stoker on the Bywell Castle who claimed that the bridge crew were drunk, when in fact it was he, the stoker, who was drunk. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not drunk, you're drunk. Uh, oh, there's a character witness uh, for him said, well, Purcell was like the generality of firemen. He was rather the worst for the drink, but not so bad he could not take his watch. <laughs> that is <laughs> damning with faint praise. Mm, uh, also, yeah, he was one of the guys rescuing folks in the lifeboat, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like getting hauled out of the out of the sewage nightmare by a slightly drunk man. Yeah. <laughs> And by slightly drunk, I mean I mean that he's had like a catastrophic amount of of rum or whiskey, but like is oh. inured to it by like a habitual alcoholism and also being like you know like both fat and strong. Um, Probably Porter, actually. Rag. Ah, yeah, yeah. The coroner ultimately did not assign specific blame, but tended towards indicating problems on the Princess Alice. Um, you know. That the death of the said William Beachy and others was occasioned by drowning in the waters of the River Thames from a collision that occurred after sunset between a steam vessel called the Bible Castle and a steam vessel called the Princess Alice, whereby the Princess Alice was cut in two and sunk, such collision not being willful, that the Bible Castle did not take the ne necessary precaution of easing, stopping, and reversing her engines in time, and that the Princess Alice contributed to the collision by not stopping and going astern, that all collisions in the opinion of the jury might in the future be avoided if proper and stringent rules and regulations were laid down for all steam navigation on the River Thames. Just like, now, hey, we should invent some, like, rules about this. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like the, the part where they talk about stopping and easing are perfunctory, and really the thing is, well, we should probably have some navigation rules here. Mm. Um, but also we consider that the Princess Alice was on the 3rd of September seaworthy. We think the Princess Alice was not properly and sufficiently manned we think the number of persons on board the princess alice was more than prudent and we think the means of saving life on board the princess alice were insufficient for a vessel of her class now well, that'll never happen again i'm sure no no, no, no. Um, of course not so the board of trade tried to assign blame in their own separate uh, investigation sort of found that well both ships are responsible and nothing really came of that. Both companies tried to sue each other uh, for the exact same amount. So uh, 2,000 pounds, which I guess was a lot of money back then. 
This um, seems like almost entirely the the Princess Alice's fault, you know? Yes. Yes, because Captain Harrison was completely exonerated after some time, but his mental health was just in complete shambles. He never went to sea again. Oh, God damn it. That's really yeah. sad. Yeah. yeah, I was about to say, he did everything right. He like, hired the pilot. He, he got was the driving pilot the and everything, yeah. yeah. Um, but as a result of this, new navigation rules were implemented on the Thames. They were strictly enforced by the River Police, the Thames River Police, which is like a separate maritime enforcement division. Yeah, it got um, subsumed by the Met at some point. Ah, yeah. oh, that sucks. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. There were new steam uh, rescue launches placed cool. at st strategic locations along the river to be crewed and on standby at all times. Uh, this also resulted in the idea that maybe we should treat sewage for the first time Novel rather fun. than dumping it raw into the river. Yeah. Right. So they built the first sewage treatment plant right there <laughs> at the north outflow. And uh, after, you know, they had put all the sewage into settling ponds, they discharged only the water into the river. And then the muck and the nasty sludge was taken out by barge into the North Sea and dumped. One of those uh, barges was named Basiljet, by the way. Yes. Uh, it's a real, a real honor to be like, you know, I built you this cathedral of shit, and in return you give me a barge full of shit. Yes, exactly. Um, the Royal Albert Dock was constructed in 1880 to separate heavy shipping from river cruises and smaller boats up the Thames, right? Mm. Um, you it's know, there's luxury flats now, I think. Uh, no, it's London City Airport. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. Even <laughs> worse. That's why there's water all around it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, sort of imagine that when something bad happened, the government did something other than, I don't know, starting a war. Mm. Um, you know, truly this was Britain's 9-11, but there was a completely <laughs> oh, <God>. different, <laughs> completely different response. Yeah. Well, I mean, did... Victorians, the kind of like, uh, uh, wig history kind of like improvement thing. Um, yeah. You know, okay, many, many people have to die, but you're like, oh, well, we should probably, like, sort this out then. Whereas now, eh, you know. Let them die. Yeah, yeah. It's like, ah, could, could, we, could we bomb someone? Skill Is issue. there someone we could bomb to fix this? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's because of wokeness is why. Yeah. Um, SS Bywell Castle continued to operate with a new captain. It actually saved one more stricken ship in its career. What kind of misunderstood hero ass ship is, <laughs> is, is going on here, you know? It was a like, full oh, ass passenger liner, the SS California, wow. which they towed 900 miles to Halifax, Nova Jesus. Scotia. God damn. This is so so like one time a like pleasure cruiser hurls itself in front of this <laughs> yes. ship, and now it's like the death ship. Now it's like Meanwhile, cursed. it's been like fishing people out of the fucking water for like decades yeah it's like it's it's uh it, it 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 what what's like the it's not kill to death rest uh ratio i guess kill to rescue ratio <laughs> yeah. very bad yeah. but only because of one incident that was not its fault oh, yeah yeah uh, it's not gonna get ranked at this rate right? yeah <laughs> In 1883, it disappeared while on a voyage between Alexandria, Egypt, and Hull, Yorkshire. Wow. I mean, yeah. you, you just seldom have a ship disappear, you know? Yeah. There's a kind of um, romance to it. Yeah, it's just gone. No one knows what happened to it. Um, and, uh, of course, what of the pleasure gardens? Well, I mean, I hope that they filled in the bear pit. The bear pit's still there, but with weird contemporary art on top of it, instead nice. of bears. I mean, I, I prefer that to the bears. Um, yeah. It's weird that they kept the form of the bear pit. They kept the form of the, the bear pit's grade two listed, but apparently that doesn't mean you have to keep it open. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to keep yeah, the bears they, in there, actually. They filled in, they filled in the pit and put contemporary art over it and turned the whole thing into a housing development. Mm -hmm. Um... And yeah, that's the story of Britain's worst inland maritime disaster. I think one of the worst man-made disasters of all time. 
it's genuinely just like truly. yeah, yeah it's just and it's just bad driving it was like, don't, bad don't drive yeah. across a, like yeah. coal shit Whee! Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's the worst part is we'll never hear the 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 princess alice side because all those guys just died instantly yeah 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 just hurtling what, themselves what did they into think a they were doing i i don't know you know yeah uh, I did read from one source that, for whatever reason, the normal helmsman had left at the uh, at, at Gravesend, and there was a more inexperienced seaman on duty. But mm. also that, um, come on, guys, uh, yeah. this is port to port, easy port, stuff. Port to port, this is not difficult. Even though it was not enforced, no one cared. I mean, you see yeah. how big that thing is. <laughs> And the guy's being nice and moving over so you can get around. I know, I know. You try and practice defensive driving, and what happens? You know? What happens is that you, you get pilloried by the press. That's, the, that's another thing that happened. I, I've neglected to mention it in the notes, but some of the original illustrations that showed up in the newspapers showed the Princess Alice being hit on the port side, which would indicate sort of a more, like, being rammed by the coal ship mm. um rather than the Hurling very stupid maneuver yeah, yeah right. exactly <laughs> so it's it it's it that's one of the reasons why you know the captain's mental health was like just in shambles afterwards yes, is because right. you know everyone's like this idiot wrecked his ship into another ship it's like no that idiot wrecked his ship into mine <laughs> 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 but yeah i I don't know. This is this is uh, I don't know. This is the, a hell of a disaster. A, a classic, a classic one. one. Yeah, is, yeah, I don't want to be covered in the poop storm. Oh, Drowning in the poop God, storm. No, the 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 unwashable slime is yes. the one that haunts me. For yeah, that. I don't like that. Those people are still in a mass grave with the slime on them. I've been oh. to Warp Tour. I don't need the unwashable yeah. slime. Like the Nickelodeon gunk. Yeah, that's how it's I visualize dark, it. A dark portent of the Dave Matthews Band incident. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a good uh, good episode to do in like April, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, so what did we learn? Um, I, I learned to drive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, treat your sewage. Stay, stay on the correct side of the river. Yeah, don't, don't be that uh, asshole. Don't d d don't trap bears and make them fight for. Human amusement. Uh, you got to tell that to the guys in Burn. Yeah, no kidding. They still got a bear pit, although the bear pit is connected to an actual bear habitat. So the bears only go in the pit if they feel like it. Mm. They feel like they need to just duke it out. Yeah. <laughs> I think all the bears in the bear pit like each other. Good. Just like hanging out. Or yeah, they're just hanging out stuff. in the pit. Bear yeah. conversation pit. Fuck, bear conversation good. pit. Yeah. <laughs> well. We have a segment on this podcast called Safety Third. <laughs> it's untight. Thank you. Shake hands for danger. I was trying to time, I was trying to hold in the sneeze so I could hit the safety third and then mute myself. And no, no, uh, torture. Safety third. Hello to the guest and no one else. Eh, wrong. Mm -hmm. Dipshit. Nope. No guest. Mm hmm. Uh,. No, this is this is not this this entire joke here that you wrote does not work. I'm 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 joke, You're vetoing that, it. You're not reading it. Joke that only works in text removed. Um <laughs> I have something deeply embarrassing to admit, which is that as a teenager I did white trash ocean gate. It, <laughs> is, okay. is Ocean Gate not already white trash ocean gate? Yeah, but let's hear it. <laughs> let's hear it, yeah. When I was a young teenager in Michigan, I was obsessed with the idea of building my own diving bell helmet. Yes. I got wow. the idea. <laughs> I got the idea after seeing a diving helmet that had been a gathering dust in the back of the family's woodshed for over 50 years that my great grandfather had built out of galvanized steel sheet metal welded together. Ooh. For those who don't know, welding galvanized steel is extremely difficult to do and dangerous for your health because of the zinc oxide that forms. Effects of inhaling zinc oxide fumes include a flu-like illness, neurological damage, cancer, and eventually death. Exciting. 
To achieve neutral buoyancy, this helmet used two large plates of lead bolted to the front and back. The lead <laughs> plates. I see the lead plates. Yeah. The lead plates look to be custom <coughs> cast in order to match the curvature of the helmet. Something tells me my great grandfather didn't use proper PPE for working with lead or zinc fumes while building this diving no. helmet in the 1950s. This is in the 50s? Incredible. This is a rare multi slide safety third. <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> Being a young lad who was afraid of welding and on a budget, I needed to build my second diving helmet out of a material that was cheaper and easier to work with than galvanized steel. Naturally, I settled on plywood. <laughs> <laughs> Madness. Madness. In hindsight, I probably should have been more afraid of drowning than I was of welding. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that's, that's also the Ocean Gate sort of motto. <laughs> Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a buoyant material obviously presents its own challenges for constructing a diving apparatus. However, with enough weight, the combined buoyancy of the air and wood could, in theory, be counteracted to achieve neutral buoyancy. This was achieved by tying sash counterweights from old single hung windows salvaged from a recently renovated house. Amazing. Wow. wow. It sounds living in Fallout. Like, what? So, uh, some, someone, someone got a bad deal on windows. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got know, those old counterweighted windows. They're so nice to move up and down. Come on, you got rid of those for what? Vinyl garbage? I, mm. Go fuck yourself. Um, <laughs> I wanted to go even further, though, so I constructed a liquid ballast tank on the back that could be filled with air or water using a series of valves and the same air supply I was using for breathing. Okay. Wow. A side effect of constructing it out of wood was that my helmet needed significantly more weight to keep it neutrally buoyant other than the one uh, more neutrally buoyant than the one my grandfather built. The design called for four weights to be slotted in the horizontal holes in the front and back of the helmet, but I underestimated the needed weight. So additional weights had to be tied to the ends of the other weights using rope in order to achieve neutral buoyancy. These are facts that will become important in a minute. Uh, I mean, it all sounds ludicrously dangerous already. It sure does. After some simple testing near the dock, I decided How it was simple. time to try something more ambitious. Dunk your head in the water. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to inspect the crib of my neighbor's buoy out in the lake. This particular crib was an old bathtub filled with large rocks. Well, I can see why you wanted to see it. I mean, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I'd love to see something like that. <laughs> Underwater, the damn. The yeah. <laughs> wow, planet, it's in Blue Planet too. Blue Planet. <laughs> we found a clawfoot tub full of rocks. <laughs> This was located at a depth of about 15 feet, but far enough away from the shore that my air supply would need to travel with me. To supply the breathing air to the helmet, I had my buddies stationed in a tiny rowboat with a small 12-volt air mattress pump and car battery. I, I don't... Sweet Jesus. Using a rope, I pulled the boat behind me so there wouldn't be tension on my air supply hose and my friend sat in the boat to make sure nothing went wrong with the air pump. For a while, everything was going fine. I slowly walked along the bottom surface of the lake like Captain Jack Sparrow in his upside-down canoe. By the way, I think I forgot to copy-paste into the previous slide an entire section about um, the horrible lung explosion that happens if you ascend to the surface while holding your breath. Oh, the uh, bends, yeah, yeah. No, not, not the, the bends. not the, well, no, the there's bends? a different thing than the bends. Oh. Yeah, the, th the thing that always gives me nightmares about how if you're in a submarine escape suit, you have to, like, breathe out constantly. If you breathe in, you damage your lungs. And it makes me think about that, and I realize that I can't breathe out all the time when I'm, like, not uh, having my lungs constantly expanded by being well, in a submarine escape suit. I was about to say, suit, it probably so has... Panic and, mm. probably has... Probably has a lot to do with the fact that there will be more volume of air in your lungs. Yeah, but I, I, I understand that, like, uh, intellectually, but psychologically, I'm just, uh, yeah, no. Um, yeah. You probably wouldn't be able to breathe in. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. helpful. 
up. So here, here's here's the bathtub down here. <laughs> Fantastic. Here, here's our man in in the box. Mm -hmm. uh, here's Beautiful the boat. diagram work. Beautiful tie. Here's a fun On both sides fish. Really. Yeah. So my liquid ballast system even functioned, allowing me to return to just below the surface of the water and dive back down by fiddling with my valves. I was I approached the crib and was briefly able to observe some fish, using it as a habitat from the relative comfort of the heavy, wet, and loud box my head was in. Here is where things started to go wrong. The sound of the air pump was quite loud and echoed down the hose and inside the hard surfaces of the heavily lacquered plywood. Suddenly it got very quiet, and the water level inside of the, inside of the helmet began to rise. Oh no. I did, I did have a check valve inside the helmet, only one I had recycled from an old snorkel mask, and it was not adequate to fully counteract the pressure at my current depth. As the volume of air in the helmet decreased, the helmet became proportionally more heavy at an alarming rate, much heavier than the old helmet my grandfather had built, as I had needed to use much more weight to counteract the buoyancy of the wood and, larger, and a larger cubic rather than cylindrical volume of air. Yeah, why is it a cube? It's plywood. Oh, yeah, that's a yeah. good point. Uh, this is a kid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't... Kids are morons. Yeah, yeah, I don't recall the exact number, but I think I had 60 or 70 pounds of window weights tied to the helmet with a mess of rope. As the water started lapping at my chin, I tried oh, no. to lift the helmet off my head as I didn't want the helmet to be on its side at the bottom of the lake as it'd be much harder to recover. However, with the extreme weight and lack of handles, this was extremely hard to do. Moments later, I realized I would not have the luxury of lifting the helmet straight off my head as the water was up to my mouth, and the added weight brought me to my knees to keep from falling over. Uh, the time had come to abandon ship. I tilted my body to the side, letting the helmet fill with water, and let the weights hit the bottom of the lake, all while being careful not to get tangled in the ropes holding the weights to my front and rear. I slipped out and swam to the surface, remembering to exhale the air in my lungs as I did. Which, again, I'm like... Yeah. Yeah. The whole event must have been mere seconds from start to finish, but it felt like minutes went by down there as I contemplated my watery grave. Yeah. As I came to the surface and pulled myself onto the rowboat, my friend informed me that the tiny pump, which was clearly inadequate for this application, had started squirting water out its air intake, so they turned it off. Yeah! <laughs> Fuck you, buddy. I'm not sure exactly what the physics of this was, as I was still receiving at least some surface air, or at least pressure inside the helmet, before the pump was turned off. Perhaps there was some kind of strange bidirectional flow in the hose, and it was easier for the air to then going around the bottom lip of the diving bell at that depth and pressure, but that goes against my understanding of how fluids and pressure work. I'm not quite sure. I've never taken a fluid dynamics class. I suppose the pressure of the water and the pressure of the air the mattress pump could generate must have been just about equilibrium at that depth. I think before you build the diving helmet, I, you, I would probably take a fluid dynamics class. You would maybe. think, right, but, you yeah. know. They don't well, offer those in high ones. school. Yeah, that's true. I was upset my friend had turned the pump off at that time, but looking back, if they hadn't, I might have been chilling with the fish at pressure equilibrium for a while, thus breathing my own exhalation in a tightly confined space and giving myself carbon monoxide poisoning. That's so, that's so many different ways of killing yourself to look at a bathtub. Well, here's it's the thing. You might, you might, you'd probably get carbon dioxide poisoning, which is actually quite painful. You would notice very quickly. Hmm. Now, going unconscious from carbon monoxide poisoning 15 feet underwater covered in ropes and weights would have been much more deadly than having to unexpectedly ditch the helmet would have been. Since the incident, I've been too much afraid for my life to take the helmets out again. Both diving yes. helmets sit in the attic, gathering dust and waiting for the oral history of their dangers to be forgotten. So they, they may once at one day again inspire some progency of mind to shake hands with danger. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for creating this excellent podcast, bringing a much-needed leftist perspective to discussions about engineering disasters. Best, best regards from Nico. 
Thank you. Yeah, you yeah thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you didn't die. Please, <laughs> please do not also kill your great grandchild. Yeah. Well, too late. It's up in the attic. Mm, yeah. We got, we got two postscripts here. Oh boy. P.S. My great great grandfather was run down by run down by a a Paramarque train. Is it Par? I always forget how this railroad is pronounced. Paramarquette. Uh, yes, it's in Michigan. Paramarquette. Yes. At the Englewood station in Chicago while on his way to visit his wife and children in Michigan. The station was configured such that you had to walk across the tracks to re access the outer platforms. His obituary reads, The exact manner of his death is not known. No one recalls having seen him again until the train had gone and his body lay on the tracks. A broken so box long containing... suckers. Yeah. A broken box containing candy and cakes evidently intended for his children was found behind, beside his body. Aww. And, and his child was like, I am going to build a gonna... diving helmet about yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> your, your family are all insane. Yes. Which we congratulate you on, honestly. Post I mean, post congratulations script. on having found the original trauma that inspired yeah. this kind yeah. of like intergenerational diving helmet sure. saga. Yeah, post postscript. Here are some diagrams of the diving helmet that I used to build it. Cool. Uh, but please don't do it again. Yeah. Kids, don't try this at home. No, no we can't emphasize do that it, one enough, really. Do it at school where your friends can see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like if you, if you want to be underwater more than anything, and you want to do it, you insist on doing it in your teens, um, this is not a piece of advice I would give to many people. I, I fear you must join the Navy. Um, this is a this is a very elaborate project for a teenager. I will say that. Yeah, it's not even for like a school project. No, just not, e not even to like impress a girl. It's just like just no. See the bathtub. I just want to see my neighbor's bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just gonna build a diving helmet because it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> White trash ocean gate actually undersells it a little bit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was possible, but there we are. There we are. Amazing. A salute to American ingenuity. American yes, excellence. This is Hell the yeah. sort of stuff. This is the sort of stuff that the liberals won't let you do anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's a wokeness. It's, it's a wokeness. Yeah. It's true. Well, that was safety third. Oh shit. Shake hands for danger. I'm so tired, dude. Didn't Our next that. episode will be. Chernobyl. Does anyone have any commercials before we go? No. Uh, go to bed. Yeah, we have, we have a Patreon. Subscribe to it. You already heard that. Bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.